Christmas is familiar to all of us. The sights, sounds, smells, the beloved traditions, they have all shaped our perspective on this most loved holiday. This is the time of year when people spend more time with family, take more time to decorate, feel more nostalgic, and act more sentimental. This is the time of year when people think more about the needs of others and actually give more to help meet those needs. But shouldn't our perspective on the celebration of Jesus' birth be shaped more by God's Word and less by the culture? Shouldn't we take the time to look at Christmas through the eyes of those who appear on the pages of the Bible, those who are actually a part of the story? I think that would change our lives forever. All right, well, good morning again, and uh, excited to be here and studying God's Word with you, worshiping Jesus with you. I uh, hope you enjoyed that Christmas music. I know I did, and looking forward to the next couple weeks where we get to do the same. Um, listen, we've been doing a, a series called Christmas in Perspective, and um, what we're going to do is kind of get an idea of what we mean by that. When we're looking at perspective. We're thinking about, for example, if a um, shooting star came down, and fell right now, we used this last week, and uh, you know, somebody might say it was a shooting star, somebody could say it was a huge uh, light that fell from the sky, somebody could say I saw fire in heaven. You know, it might be any one of those things uh, that you would say. And um, you, someone might say I saw it by angel's rest, someone else by Selenice, uh, someone else that landed in a field, uh, someone could say that I saw smoke, someone could say it saw a certain color, you know, and all those things. And uh, the truth is these aren't different events. Okay, the, the showing inconsistencies. If that were to happen, it would be different accounts of the very same event. Okay, we actually have that when we look at the Gospels and we realize Matthew, Mark, Luke, John all came from different perspectives and sometimes talked about the very same thing and had a little bit different perspective of how that all came about. And so uh, this is a four week series on, uh, on these different perspectives of Christmas and um, you know, if it's an Old Testament character, uh, we're looking at the way they would have perceived the Messiah coming. If it's a New Testament character, we're reflecting on uh, their feelings and experiences when he did come and those kind of things. So it's going to be a lot of fun. We're only covering four, but I need you to know that there's a devotional out right now. And if you're unaware of it or haven't accessed it, and, and forgive me, I keep going at my ear here. Something is not right on this mic. I think it's just on the, my back. So anyway... Rob, you don't need to cut that out. Just let that remain just like it is. Um, but anyway, see that thing keep falling like that? Here. I'm going to go on a handheld, okay? Okay. You can hear me on the handheld. We're just going to go with that, and so I'm no longer reaching for my ear every three seconds. <laughs> All right, so we're talking about Christmas in perspective, and we were mentioning the... Um, the devotional. Now, if you haven't accessed that, we're on day five, which means you can go back and read the other four if you'd like, or you can just start on day five. Uh, mine, I think, is tomorrow, so it'll be on day six. Um, that's one of mine, and I believe another one's on the 13th and the 25th, something like that. Um, but either way, if you have never downloaded the app, and yes, I'm doing this in the middle of the sermon, okay? So here it is. It's called Hope on the Go. And when you go to Hope on the Go, you have an option here of clicking which location. This is the NRV. When you click on that, the very first thing that comes up on the top is Christmas in Perspective. You click on that one time, and it pulls up. I'd like to say it pulls right up. It's probably the internet connection here, and it will. But it's some 60 pages, uh, and, and uh, again, multiple devotions, 25, from the pastors of Hope Church. And I'd really encourage you to look that up. You can also access it on Facebook. Go there, and um, we've presented the link and so forth. And, uh, and so I'd like you to take advantage of that. But all the Hope locations are doing the same thing together. This is the first time we've ever done this. All right, Christmas in perspective. So the only difference is, today I'm preaching a message on the exact same topic as everyone else, but I'm using where I feel God wants me to go and my own passages that I think about when I think about this topic, 
Okay, so it's our own sermons, but it's everybody doing it together. So on our text thread, we get to talk about this and, and, and where people are going, what they're talking about, verses that they'll mention. Last night it was neat because somebody brought up something and another person chimed in and, and said, that's probably not very relevant. And the person said, yeah, no, I just thought it was interesting. And, and you know, we just get that. So hopefully today you're going to get the, the milk, you're going to get the real stuff here, and that's what I'm hoping I'm going to be able to give to you. Um, but... We, last week, we talked about the perspective of God the Father, and this week, we're going to talk about the perspective of the shepherds. So we're going right there to the field uh, on the day that he was born, and so that brings us to Luke chapter 2, and that's going to be our main text. Um, so I'm going to start in Luke 2, but I want to read the beginning part, and then we're really going to focus in verses 8 and following. So here it is, the birth of Jesus Christ according to Luke verse 1. In those days a decree went out from Caesar Augustus that all the world should be registered. This was the first registration when Quirinus was governor of Syria. And all went to be registered, each to his own town. And Joseph also went up from Galilee, from the town of Nazareth to Judea to the city of David, which is called Bethlehem, because he was of the house and lineage of David. To be registered with Mary is betrothed who was with child, and while they were there, the time came for her to give birth. Go figure that. That's called God, but that's man's worst nightmare, a woman's worst nightmare, and there it was, okay? So, verse 7, she gave birth to her firstborn son, son and wrapped him in swaddling cloths and laid him in a manger because there was no place for them in the inn. And then it takes us to verse 8. And in the same region there were shepherds out in the field keeping watch over their flock by night. Now, very interesting. When you get to the shepherds, you get to the, just the question comes up of who were these shepherds? You know, what, what were they doing out there? Of course, we kind of know they were keeping sheep and protecting the sheep and they're watching out for uh, predators, watching out for other people who might steal them, all those things, just keeping the sheep safe in the evening time and all that going on. But, you know, who exactly were these shepherds? And a lot has been put out in speculation. A lot of things are, are, are put out there. Many different reasons that people suggest as to who these shepherds really are. And at the end of the day, we're going to end in a speculation too. So we're just sort of going to look at this and see what some have said. Truthfully, some, a lot over the last couple hundred years at least, people have said that shepherds were social outcasts. And, you know, I did a bunch of research on this because if you go online or you read some books, you might find some things in opposition to that statement that know, in fact, that they were not. They were of the priestly order, these particular shepherds and so forth. And I'll give a little bit of evidence to that. But the truth is, from everything you can read, all kinds of biblical references and all kinds of extra-biblical references suggest that, no, that wasn't quite the way they looked at them. Even, even in Genesis 46, and we're not going to go there, but Genesis 46, 34, um, it's talking about Egypt, and it literally says, every shepherd is an abomination to the Egyptians. Okay, that's what it says. So do you think they're really of a good light? No, they're kind of looking down on them. Shepherds aren't the, the best of class, as it were. Aristotle, the Babylonian Talmud, uh, the Mishnah, which we'll refer to a little bit later, um, just some readings of Jewish rabbi, basically, um, Philo, and, and others have, have made statements toward that these people were either, uh, they were not truthful in the things that they did. Uh, of course, they were dirty because they were outside all the time. They didn't quite have the hygiene of everybody else. But they were just sort of social outcasts. Maybe not quite as bad as the tax collectors, you know, but they, they were maybe the next rung up. And that's kind of the, the impression that we get. But we also have to make note of something. There are shepherds that fill the Bible. I mean, how far do you have to go back? How about Abel? Yeah, Abel was a shepherd. You can, you can go and you can think of Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Rachel, Moses. Rachel was a shepherdess. Moses was a shepherd out there for 40 years, running from God in essence, when God finally reaches him in the, in the burning bush. David, matter of fact, it says in 2 Samuel 7, 8, that he went from the pasture to be a prince. And so literally, you, again, biblical support for suggesting that you went from a lowly position to a high position, okay? So they're not looked highly upon. And then you have others like Job, Amos, uh, even God himself, and you can reference it right away, Psalm 23, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. 
And so when you look at that and think about it, yeah, they, they may be looked down upon, but even God the Father, even Jesus refers to himself, John 10, 11, just quick references, as the good shepherd, Hebrews 13, 20, as the great shepherd, and then 1 Peter 5, 4, as the chief shepherd, when the chief shepherd shall appear. So we might look down on the class of shepherds, but you cannot look down upon the people because the people were some of the most amazing people, let alone Jesus Christ himself, calling him the good shepherd, the great shepherd, and the chief shepherd. But you see, in the Old Testament, when the Israelites were moving from place to place, and, and I'm thinking about leaving Egypt, wandering for 40 years and through the wilderness, and then, and then the next so many years going back through Israel, crossing the Jordan, getting over into their land, as it were, you have to realize that during that time, they were a nomadic people. So the shepherd trait, the shepherd job, shepherding, was like top of the line. Now, the, the Egyptians hated it because they slew them and left them and all those kind of things. But as far as Israel was concerned, that was the job to have because everybody needed meat on the travel. Everybody needed to have sacrifice, all these things. And so then it seems as if, according to history, that their job was high in, in respect. But over time, when they finally settled in the land and, and the need was less, it was more for just for meat or just uh, simply for sacrifices and those things. It was at that point that then they sort of began to get more of a bad name, uh, so to speak. And so um, there were potentially, as we understand, the Mishnah teaches something that we don't regularly look at, but there's a, a couple places and a couple things that state some things about who these shepherds might have been or uh, what shepherds did back in that day. And there were a group of shepherds who kept flocks, um, potentially destined for the temple, that is, for sacrifices. So uh, they were out there. As a matter of fact, there's another thing that I didn't know about before, so I'm going to state something to you, and some of you may have known this, and you can say, I knew this and my pastor didn't, okay? Here it is. Uh, there's a place called Migdal Eder, okay? And it is basically a tower, it is called the Tower of Adair, and in Genesis 35, 21, it actually says that and calls it the Tower of Adair, okay? And this, this Migdal Adair, or Tower of Adair, was a tower that was located, according to other sources, less than a mile outside of Bethlehem, so where the sheep would have been, right? And it was this tower that they would stand on where they could see far out and be able to know exactly where their flocks were. So... Think about this for a second. We know, according to the rest of the story that we're getting ready to come to, that this was in the fields, right on the outskirts of Bethlehem, on the outside of town. We know that there was this tower that was there. It's very likely that some of these shepherds were actually on top of the tower, down on bottom, looking around. They were right there at this Migdala there. You know, and potentially they could have even been shepherds who had priestly duties, or at least the duty of uh, gathering together the sheep and keeping care of them. So they're an interesting group of people. Yeah, maybe outcast, maybe looked down upon, um, but all that's playing a part. And you can also go to Micah chapter 4 and Micah 5, and you can kind of read some uh, things that would link that tower of Adair, Migdal Adair as well. Um, but... You know, another thing that people say is the shepherds, uh, being shepherds, would have known exactly where the manger was. That kind of makes sense, doesn't it? A place where you feed animals. So who better to go to than shepherds who were feeding animals and who would have to do that? And they would know that when the angel said, he's in the manger, that they would know exactly where to go. And that's another point to, to take note of. But, you know, one of the things that gets me, and one of the things that I think about when I think about these shepherds, is the theme of of shepherds that surrounds not only really the context of the entire Bible, as I've briefly pointed out, but also the context specifically in regards to his birth. I want to take you to Micah chapter 5, and uh, it's a classic passage uh, that we actually sang a little bit about in Bethlehem just a few moments ago, and it says here, But you, O Bethlehem Ephrathah, who are too little to be among the clans of Judah, for from you shall come forth from me one is to be ruler in Israel, whose coming forth is from of old, from ancient days. Now you read that initially and you say, is that talking about the Messiah? But I want you to know that they definitely thought that that was talking about the Messiah. But it goes on, verse 3. Therefore he shall give them up until the time when she who is in labor is given birth, 
Then the rest of his brothers shall return to the people of Israel. And verse 4 says, And he shall stand and shepherd his flock in the strength of the Lord. Here we're talking about the coming of the Messiah and a reference to him shepherding the flock. So who better to go to but the shepherds? It makes a point, doesn't it? It goes from there. As a matter of fact, I can just stop there. And, and well, you can read the rest of the verse. simply says, and, and his flock and the strength of the Lord and the majesty of the name of the Lord is God. And they will dwell secure for he will, he will be great to the ends of the earth. And just the beginning of five just simply says, and he shall be their peace. You know? And so they knew that this was the Messiah. But now take that, take the idea of the shepherding there, and let's go to Matthew. And in Matthew chapter 2, verse 5, it says this, They told him, In Bethlehem of Judea, for so it is written of the prophet, or by the prophet, and you, O Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, are by no means least among the rulers of Judah. They skip down to include the part in verse 3 and 4 there, which says, For from you shall come a ruler who will shepherd my people Israel. So what is the passage that they remembered, that they equated with his coming? Was Micah 5, 2 through 4, which references the shepherds and the idea of shepherding. So who better to come to than the shepherds who know exactly where the manger are, who's sitting there, by the way, what do you think shepherds do out there? Any, anybody ever been just in pitch black dark out there in the middle of the night? You ever been outside? You look around? Have you ever been to where you cannot really see five feet in front of you? I've been there, okay? That's, a, that's sometimes a fairly scary place to be, especially if you hear a noise. Like one time I heard in Brazil. Uh, that's where Beth and I met, by the way. Uh, but we were out there in Brazil, and, and there, there had a, a bull had gotten loose. And, I, of course, this is me. I wanted to go find it um, in the middle of the Amazon. So I'm out there and uh, get close enough. And it wasn't dark. That wasn't the scenario. But the scenario is the Amazon where you cannot see from me to five feet in front of you because of everything that's there. And all of a sudden I hear <clears throat> like this. And it did it again. And I said, huh. I think it's time to leave. <laughs> I think it's time to back up. Um, I think we found it, but I don't want to see it anymore because if it comes charging through there, it's going to be a bad day. Anyway, point is, if it's pitch black dark, you, don't, you almost can't even see your own hand in front of your face, right? Now, if that's the case, and again, it is, going back to Bethlehem, all the way back to there, they didn't have all the street lights we have today. They didn't have all the lights on in their house, probably at this time of night, you would reckon. But all of a sudden, what they do have is what's sitting in the sky. You know, I think if I was a shepherd, I would really enjoy every single night falling to sleep looking up at the sky and being able to see all the stars. It's the only thing to look at. I mean, all the stars that are up there, you would know the constellations, you would know movements, you would see things. It would just be sort of a second nature kind of thing. And so again, you know, are we going to go to the tax collector who is, you know, head down counting his money? Uh, no, we're not going to go there. We're going to go to the priest who's apparently must be studying and studying the Torah. And No, I'm probably not going to go there. How about we go to the one who's going to be looking up already? That's the shepherd who has his mind or his attention directed right toward the heavens. And so that's what seemingly happened. Um, now, we, uh, we look at this and we think about this idea of shepherd, how he came to the shepherds, and it just reminds me of John. And John the Baptist who says, what about Jesus? Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. He says that in verse 29 of John 1. He says it again in verse 36. Behold, the Lamb of God. All right? It's twice he's referred to as the Lamb. He is the one who's going to take away the sin of the world. And, and I believe the shepherds of all people, of all groups and classifications, would have been those who understood that prophecy, understood the connection they were so in tune with a spotless lamb, whether it be that they were preparing for sacrifices or to sell in the market or whatever, that the angel's message that we're about ready to go to made perfect sense. So that's the shepherds. That's who they are. All right? Let's take a look at what happened. And so we go on, uh, Luke chapter 2. And um, in Luke 2, we're going to go down to verse 9. It says, And an angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were filled with great fear. Okay, now, first of all, realize that it was an angel, 
one single angel came with the message. The Bible does not specify who this angel was, but uh, we, we understand that Gabriel had come to uh, Joseph and to Mary before. Maybe we could just guess that it would have been Gabriel. We don't know that for a fact, but it is a single angel. The Bible does specify that. Later refers to angels in the plural. So we got a single angel who comes, and it says the glory of the Lord shone around them. The glory of the Lord was not on the angel. Okay, the angel was bearing a message, but the glory of the Lord shone around. Now, what is this glory? Okay, you have to go back to the Old Testament and realize that this is spoken of as the Shekinah glory. It's spoken of as the glory that's in the clouds, as the presence of God. Every time the glory of God appears, the presence of God appears. So we think about the clouds by night that led them through uh, the wilderness or, or, you know, after they had crossed the Red Sea, in the fire, in those clouds specifically, it says the glory of the Lord was there, that his presence was there. I think about when Moses went up on the mountain the first time, you know, and then, then they sinned with, with Aaron and, and all the others down with the golden calf on the bottom. And in chapter 33 of Exodus, the, the glory of the Lord departs. So you look at um, Exodus 33, I believe we have it on screen here, but Exodus 33 um, and verse uh, 3 and 4. It says, Go up to a land flowing with milk and honey, but I will not go up with you. This is the next chapter immediately following the golden calf. Okay? He says, I will not go up with you. Um, I will not go up among you, lest I consume you on the way, for you are a stiff-necked people. When the people heard this disastrous word, I want you to make a parallel. If you're one that writes in your Bible... I want you to make note of something. This is the phrase, of course it's a Hebrew phrase, that means evil tidings. Uh, the King James, I believe, actually translates that, evil tidings, all right? And I just think it's amazing that evil tidings are associated with the presence of the Lord departing. And then what does the angel say in Luke 2? Behold, I bring you good tidings of great joy. And what's there? The presence of of the Lord Jesus Christ as he is born right there, right next to these shepherds. So that connection is just awesome. I think that's amazing. Um, but this is, of course, they mourn. No one put on their ornaments that they had had before and so forth. Um, but the idea of the presence of the Lord left. Now, right after that, Moses gets back up. He had smashed the Ten Commandments. And he goes back up there uh, for God with his finger to write some more. And, and um, as he's up there, the Lord shows his, his, basically, I always call it the after effects of God's glory. It's kind of God going by and shows what that would look like when all the clouds swirled past that. So much so, was it amazing that Moses' face shone. Moses didn't understand it then, didn't even realize it until he gets down. Everybody's closing their eyes. Everybody's putting their hands over their face, you know, uh, making Moses put something over his face because the glory of the Lord had so impacted Moses and now has impacted them. All right, that's the glory of the Lord. Now, we've got to figure, all right, in, 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 even in Ezekiel, the glory of the Lord filled the temple and then it left the temple, right? But it's, it deals with the presence of God. So can you imagine, we always just picture, I don't know about you, but this is me. I always just picture, uh, you know, three or four little shepherds. They got a couple of sheep, you know, bam, right over here next to them, whatever. And then you look up and there's a bright light and the angel says, don't be afraid. Everything's going to be okay. There's a baby born over there. Go see him. And that, that's all you're thinking. There's so much more to this story, okay? Who the shepherds were, we've discussed that. But then this glory, can you actually imagine, can you even put in your mind what that would have looked like? Again, you can't see five feet in front of you. You're looking up at a bunch of stars, and all of a sudden, bam, there it is. The glory of God, get this, His presence is right there. What would have been their posture? They would have fallen to the ground if they weren't already there. If they were laying down, looking up at the sky, they'd have flipped over so they couldn't see a thing. They would have been shaking like leaves. Guys, we've got to get real here because sometimes we just think God is just this being up in heaven that we just pray to and, you know, He cares for us when we really, really, really need Him and, you know, all that. This is so much greater. This is the creator of the universe who made a decision that He was going to come down and be a man. 
His presence left the glories of heaven to stand right there in the middle of a black sky and just be completely bright in the horizon with the absolute glory, power, and majesty of God. And Jesus was born less than a mile away. At least if we believe Migdal Adair. And so the glory of God is right there it brings us to fear. You realize, guys, let's just, let's just be, let's be honest here. Anybody here not a sinner? Okay, my hand's going back down. Nobody here is not a sinner. Everybody here has done wrong in the eyes of God. You've hurt other people. You've definitely wronged God. And because of that, you and I deserve death and eternal damnation, and separation from God. You know, we don't like that, so pastor, can you move past that and let's go on to the real good stuff now? Let's, let's, let's hang there for just a second. Just simply to say this, nobody here, not a person who preaches once a week, not a person who leads someone to Christ every single day, not a person who's just perfect in their workplace, there's not a person who exists today that could stand when God's glory was presented. You can't do it. He's too amazing, he is too awesome, and everybody here would fall to their knees with their face in the ground, covering their eyes, and the light would still seep through somehow because he's that amazing and he's that good. Picture that now when you think of these shepherds. Picture that glory absolutely filling the sky. They cannot even look away from it. And frankly, they're scared. Because they know what kind of people they are too. And they know what they've just seen. You can't unsee that. You can't stop seeing that. You have no control over that. And at that very moment, they realize this could be the very end for them because they're in the presence of an awesome and holy and amazing God. His presence came down. His glory came down. And I just kind of wonder if when they ran into this manger scene that we're going to talk about here in a minute, if maybe the shepherd's face shone. The Bible doesn't say that. Probably didn't. But it just makes you wonder. It makes you wonder, how did Joseph and Mary just simply accept three, four, ten, however many guys it was, you know, that were out on the field, stinks and everything else, and come running out to this baby? What would they have thought? I don't know. Maybe they could see the glory of the Lord upon them from the encounter that they had just had. So God chose to dwell with man. God came down as a man, showed his glory there. God chose those shepherds to show this glory too. And what's amazing is he's given it to every one of us here too. We're just 2,000 years removed from the exact moment that it took place. But that doesn't matter. What's amazing is the message stays the same. Look at uh, Luke chapter 2 again and then uh, go to verse um, 10. And it says here in Luke 2, 10, And the angel said to them, Fear not, for behold, I bring you good news of great joy that will be for all the people. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior who is Christ the Lord, and this will be a sign for you. You will find a baby wrapped in swaddling cloths and lying in a manger, and suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of the heavenly host, praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest and on earth peace among those with whom he is pleased. Okay, so now we have something else taking place here. We have the good news. Verse 10 again, the angel said to them, don't be afraid. This is a good thing, okay? Presence of God has come among you. God has come to dwell with men and for men. Behold, I bring you good news of great joy. I've told you many times that word good news is the word uh, and, and the formation, the root word for the word gospel that we have. Um, it is literally means the ability to proclaim the gospel. So that's what we should be doing. Uh, and it says, I bring you good news of great joy that will be for all people. It's for everybody. You know, it's not just for the Jews, not just for the, the, the shepherds that were on the field. It's not just for Mary and Joseph. This is for everybody. This is going to impact the entire world. And he goes on to say that there's a sign that's going to, that's going to prove that. Um, this will be the sign. You're going to find a baby wrapped in swaddling cloths and lying in a manger. Any others in Bethlehem at that time? You know, so we wouldn't get that mixed up. <laughs> is, there, is there any baby born 
in America today that's going to be in swaddling cloths and lying in a manger. You know, if, if that's the case, I'd love to see a picture of it. Uh, I, there may be one somewhere, but it's certainly not Bethlehem, certainly not on the day that the glory of the Lord came around, and certainly not during that time. And so it was, it was a clear sign. Listen, go to the manger. Go where you're going to take the sheep later tonight, but don't wait to take the sheep. Leave them there. Glory of the Lord's among you. It's going to be okay. Just leave and go straight now to that manger where you feed them. And I want you to see this sign. You can't miss it. A woman just gave birth in the place that women don't give birth. There it is, right there. Okay, And so they end up going that way. Uh, but before they, before they leave, um, talk about that sign. There's suddenly, with the angel, a multitude of the heavenly host. Okay, Now this multitude of the heavenly host, we read later, you kind of skip down to verse 15, when it says, when the angels went away. And so to me, that's enough to think that this heavenly host is a group of angels. It could be a group of angels and so much more. Because heavenly hosts, we don't even have any idea as to how awesome heaven's going to be and all the hosts that's going to be in them, right? But this heavenly host, they were praising God and they were saying, glory to God in the highest and on earth peace among those with whom he is pleased. Now, well, what are they doing? Are they singing? Well, that's part of praising God. The Psalms kind of allude to that. You know, but part of praising God too, and the Psalms also allude to, is speaking his name, or calling out these things, in, in essence, even shouting these things, or even just praying these things. Can you just imagine for a moment, you just saw the glory of the Lord, and then suddenly a host of, a host of angels. Not, not like they all kind of come in over time, and we're watching them come down through the stars. And No, no, no. It's all of a sudden, standing there in the middle of the sky, this entire heavenly host just begins to praise God. They begin to pray. Uh, they begin to speak His name. They begin to shout. They begin to sing. They begin to do whatever it is that angels do when it comes to praising God's name. We read about this in Revelation 4 and 5. And you know, we read about in Isaiah 6, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. And, and it, you know, for some angels it could be a chant that they're over and over and over again. They just keep saying because He's just so holy and so awesome and amazing. But again, this is a multitude, all of a sudden, of hosts, heavenly hosts, just praising God. And that happens. So verse 15, when the angels went away from them into heaven, the shepherds said to one another, let us go over to Bethlehem and see this thing that has happened, which the Lord has made known to us. Many years ago, um, and, and those of you who know me know I'm kind of a Greek nerd. I like to study Greek. I like to study languages, but specifically the Greek language. And so what I did is I took some various uh, passages, Luke 2 being the main one, a couple from John, ending in Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world, you know, and some others. And I took them and I translated them on my own. You know, and, and I went and looked at every verse or every word that I couldn't understand, and I, I tried to understand it and get the proper um, interpretation of it. And I made a JSV, a J. Smith version of the Christmas story. It's what I did, okay? And, and I, I enjoyed it. It was fun. It was more for me, and then I sent it to a couple people, I think at a youth group one time. I sent it to a church another time and to another church. And um, I don't think anybody likes it as much as I do. But anyway, it was the J. Smith version of the Christmas story is what it was. But I came across this word I'm getting ready to tell you about. And I've never heard anybody talk about it. I've never seen anything in any books really reference this thing. And it bothered me because every translation did the same thing. You ready? Here it is, verse 15. When the angels went away from them into heaven, the shepherds said to one another, let us go over to Bethlehem and see this thing. It's the word thing. Well, see, what initially got me is you don't, you know, you don't really say thing in Greek. There, there's, there's words for things, okay? So you say what that thing is. Um, but the word for thing is, comes from a Greek word, rhema, is what it is. But it literally means that which is said, spoken, the spoken word, the saying, the statement, or the event. And I couldn't get neither the King James, nor the ESV here, nor the, nor the NASB, and all these translations, they all just used thing. Okay, and they didn't stop there. Look at verse 17. I'm going to skip to skip down and when they saw it they made note that they hear they call it the saying there they did attempt to translate the word right and then you go down to 19 but mary treasured all these and there's the word things again all these things well hold on, let, let's let's reinterpret that for just a moment but mary it says in verse 19 
Mary treasured up all these spoken words in her heart. Doesn't that make more sense? That's what the Greek word actually says. You know, Mary, Mary treasured these statements. She treasured that which has been said to her. What was said to her? The fact that the, the, the shepherds came and called him the Messiah and, 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 and so forth, you know, um, and told them everything that they had just seen, the glory of the Lord. Go back up to 17. And when they saw it, they made known the saying. That's a, again, that's a much better translation there. They did a better job there. But they made known that spoken word. Literally, they went and they did what the gospel required them to do and they told about the gospel. Okay, they proclaimed the good news, that good word, that, that spoken word. And back up to 15, let's go over to Bethlehem and see this, not thing, let's literally see this promised word. Let's see this sign that was told us. Let's actually visualize what we have been told. And that's what it's referring to. You know, and so here, and I want to read, I didn't read these verses, but 16 says, they went with haste, they found Mary and Joseph and the baby lying in a manger, when they saw it, they made known that saying that had been told them concerning the child. And all who'd heard it and, and wondered at what the shepherds had told them because it was a spoken word, not just a thing. And Mary treasured up all these spoken words. It's right in your Bible. It's what, the, it's what the Greek says. Pondering them in her heart. And the shepherds turned glorifying and praising God for all that they had heard, that they had seen, and for everything that had been told to them. Listen, here's the coolest part about Christmas is we see on the very first night that the Savior was born the glory of God his presence comes down upon these guys where they see it and the only reaction there's not one recorded shepherd that left that field screaming there's not one recorded shepherd that said I ain't gonna go somebody's gonna stay back and watch the sheep there's not one it says the shepherds They went, okay? Meaning they all went to go see this thing, to go see this spoken word. And what I'm here to tell you right now is that on the very first night, the gospel was brought to numbers of people. We don't know how many that the shepherds went and influenced. And we don't know what they thought, you know, smelling these guys as they're running down the streets, you know, and, and saying, you know, the, the, the Messiah is here. We saw the glory of God. It, and there was angels everywhere. And they were proclaiming the name of God. And they were glorifying and praising His name. And then we went we saw a baby that was born in a manger. And people are still gone off in the glory of God. I don't understand what in the world they're talking about. But then someone said manger and a baby born. And, and a woman gave birth in a manger. What in the world's going on? I mean, what is our town coming to you know and all these things that they're saying but what's happening is the gospel is being presented on the very first night i want you to get this baby jesus came out of the womb and cried and was held by his mother he didn't have to do anything else on that night but but yet what he did was Quite amazing, God becoming man. But I want to make this point. The shepherds, the ones who heard the message, they were the ones who went out. They were the ones who went and told everybody about what they had seen, what they had heard. Can I tell you something? This morning, you've just heard, and hopefully you've visualized what it might have looked like on that day. And you've got the same message. You have that same good news. You have the same good tidings of the presence of God that has come down to this earth. And what's even more amazing is that presence of God dwells in you as a believer. And so literally, we don't need God's presence to come down and to make our faces shine. We should somehow stand out so bright to a lost and dying world that the gospel flows out of us and they get it and understand it this is the message of the shepherds this is what we see and this is what we must do as a people as a congregation as hope church nrv as we look out into our communities this this month and say what do we take with all this that we learned about the shepherds that we've got to get out there and present this gospel present this spoken word tell people about what we've seen and heard that's what god's called us to do Let's pray. Father, we thank you for the day and 
Thank you so much for your word. Thank you for how great and awesome you are. And Lord, how, how easy it is to understand your word. Sometimes it seems very difficult. These narrative passages seem really easy sometimes. But we just take word for word and we go in and we, we read it and we understand it. And I pray that as we dwell on these shepherds, that we would not forget what happened that morning, that evening that is, and, and that we would not forget how they went immediately to Mary and Joseph and how after that they immediately went to a lost and dying world. And they shared the message. And you know what's amazing is those shepherds probably never saw fruit. They probably never saw anybody place their trust in Jesus because 30 more years had to go had to pass before he'd even start his ministry sometimes we're not going to see the results sometimes we're not going to understand the season that you have us in but the message remains the message of the gospel for thousands of years has been the same that Jesus came and died and rose again and that by believing in Him, we have everlasting life. God's presence came down in the form of a baby on that day with the sole purpose of dying for our sins. That's the gospel. That's the good news. That's what we proclaim. That's what we tell. And so God, I ask that you would help us and motivate us and move us to be able to do that. For you are great and greatly to be praised. With heads bowed and eyes closed, no one looking around at this time, in the quietness of this moment and just as we're as we're thinking about this story what part of this story is God convicting you on what part of the shepherd's testimony is God saying that's you that's where you are that's what you need to do this is how you need to act this is who you need to reach this might be who you need to talk to in the quietness of this moment I just want you to pray and talk to God Confess any sin that you have. Approach Him right now as if you were one of the shepherds in the field and He'd just shown the glory of God upon you. Tell Him what you'd be thinking. Now that message is meant to be told. And so right now, think of somebody you can share with. Think of somebody you can exemplify it to. That glory of God should shine off of you. Father, we do love you so much and we thank you for Jesus and we thank you for what he's done for us. And we pray that as a group, as a whole, the Lord, we would do what you've called us to do. And individually that we would look at our lives, take an inventory of it and say, yeah, we've got to fix this. We need to change this area. But Lord, no matter where we are in life or what we've done, how bad we've been, there's one thing that remains. And again, it's the gospel. And so I pray that we would go forth and present that and be as the shepherds were and reach a whole community with your precious word. Bless us now and use us for your glory. In Jesus' name, amen.